Dr. Alvin D. Jackson is a family practice physician at Curtis V. Cooper Primary Healthcare Incorporated in Savannah, Georgia. He has practiced medicine in Fremont, Cincinnati, Ohio, and is the former director of the Ohio Department of Health. He was appointed by Governor, Governor Ted Strickland in January 2007 and served until January 10, 2011. On May 12, 2009, he became one of the first public health officials to meet with President Barack Obama at the White House. Yes. Okay. Dr. Jackson formerly served on the Institute of, Med of the Medicine Board on Population Health and Public Health Practice. He's also the president of the Willow Hill Heritage Renaissance Center, which he is the former Willow Hill School, founded in 1874, one of the first schools for African Americans in Bullock County, Georgia. The present school building was constructed in 1954 and has been recognized as one of the best examples of an equalization school in Georgia. Dr. Jackson is currently board president of the Georgia African American Historic Preservation Network a statewide organization dedicated to the preservation of African-American history and culture. We are so fortunate. Dr. Jackson has spent more than 40 years documenting the history of the Willow Hill School and community through his collection of photographs and artifacts, while including 20,000 obituaries and funeral programs and over 500 oral recordings of African-Americans in Bullock County, Georgia. Additionally, he has done extensive research on the 38 known African-American cemeteries in Bullock County through these, the series, If These Cemeteries Could Talk. Oh, the stories they could tell. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> he has also done extensive research on African-American churches and schools in Bullock County. Dr. Jackson is an oral historian and is a highly re requested speaker on African-American history and culture, especially with respect to Bullock and surrounding counties. And I'll go on. Dr. Jackson was born in Portal, Georgia and attended Willow Hill School. He was one of the first students to integrate the Statesboro High School in Bullock County in 1965, the first year of integration in Bullock County school system and a Georgia Southern College, now Georgia Southern University. Dr. Jackson received his BS from Andrews University in Michigan. He also did undergraduate studies at Oakwood College in Alabama, Columbia University in New York and the University of Kiel in England. Dr. Jackson earned his MD from the Ohio State University College of Medicine, and he is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Robert Wood Johnson Community Health Leadership Award, the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Heidelberg University, of Ohio, 2013 Paul Edward Sluby Sr., Jean Sampson Scott, that's my alma mater, Augs, um, award from the Afro-American Historical Genealogical Society, that's based out of New York the 2016 Governor's Awards for the Arts and Humanities in Georgia, and recently he was awarded a Georgia Records Advisory Council Award. I extend to you and turn over this podium to the good Dr. <laughs> Jackson. Wow. Thank you so very much for that very uh, generous presentation. I was wondering if you were talking about me there for a minute. I want to welcome my daughter also to the podium who's going to manip manipulate the technology. You know, the era that I came from, we, we are in the pencil era. Okay. And so, uh, is this, Mike, you might need to help me with it. To that. I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should I go on this side over here? Okay. Let's go on this side over here. Okay. Well, turn this Okay. Well, thank you. Turn this off. <laughs> Do I need to use the main mic? No. Turn that mic off. <laughs> I'm not sure how to turn this one off. This one is off. I've turned that one off. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And then. Okay. Ooh. Sounds like this mic doesn't work. Yeah. How do we give you this turn, one? This, let's try this one. Yeah. Can you turn this one off? Turn it off. Take it off. Techn you know, technology. <laughs> we'll get it figured out. All right. 
Go ahead and take that off. Okay. Okay. Is that better? No, this is the problem. Maybe not. Was this on all the time? No, I just turned it on. It wasn't on. Before. Let's see how you do without the. Oh. Yeah, I'm pleased to have my daughter, my firstborn. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kingate Jackson, uh, OBGYN of Stetchers and Gynecology, oh, right yes. in Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> Her name, Kingay, is from the Bajidi people of Ghana. Oh, Ms. Brilliant. Speak to him. <laughs> And since I'm talking about my children, my next born Dr. Atiba Jackson, orthopedic surgeon in Cincinnati, Ohio. Atiba, I gave all of my children African names. Yes. I came through the era where names were important. And you had to be the first one to know your name. We had naming ceremonies, we whispered into their ear, then we told everybody else what their name was. All right, and then my next, Jelani. Kafua. Now you need to hear that word kafua. It means father shared the birth pain. Oh. I thought I was pregnant with the <laughs> I was doing all the stuff my wife normally does. So we had to give Delania first name kafua. And then our last daughter, Willowese Alima. She's named after my mother, Willowese, who died very tragically when I was 17 months old. So I was raised by grandparents, and that's a lot of how I got a lot of this history. But I wanted my mother's memory to continue. And there's an old expression which say you're not truly dead yeah, until they stop Don't calling your name. So Willow is mama, I'm gonna keep your name moving. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being. We have 10 grandchildren, or soon to be 10. My daughter will have one in May, that would be 10. And I want to do this in honor of my wife who recently passed in August of 2023. I've known her for 51 years and that was a pill to better to digest. And I haven't yet swallowed it. And so this is done in her memory because she was so instrumental in all that I did. We worked as a team. We happy to see folk here from Goffin, Miss Angie, Mr. Hill. Good to see y'all in the back there. Thank y'all so much. And also those who have come, my son-in-law there, who is uh, my daughter's husband and my grandchildren, we happy that they all could be present. So my story goes back a long time ago when I was a lad after the death of my mother. Her deathbed wish was that her mother would raise her three children. And so we went into the house of our grandparents. Now, my grandfather was born in 1892. Mm. My grandmother, 1900. So y'all know I came up the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> the rough side of the mountain. Boy, your back doesn't hurt. Come on, my, <laughs> my grandfather talking. So, but my grandparents had a lot of friends born in the 1890s. And after work, they would all sit around and they would talk about the days of slavery, talked about the Willow Hill School, and talked about things in time gone by. And for some reason, don't know why, I was fascinated. I was listening. Sometimes when you run old folk, you can't let them know you're listening. Because they say, boy, go out and play. <laughs> so you got to play what you call possum, like you sleep or something. But I was getting a lot of information. And then soon I started writing this down years ago, 40, 50 years ago, and then I started recording it to hear the voices. And so I have recordings of people that were born in the 1880s all the way to the present. These were wow. the children of former slaves and grandchildren of former slaves in their own words telling what life was like about them. And then many of them that eventually left as part of the Great Migration and traveled north I traveled north and got your stories as well to give a complete story of what happened. Now, cemeteries was always an important part 
in their lives. Each year we would go out in the cemetery and clean it up. And my grandmother would walk. She'd say, that's meal, that's wash. And she put that in our brains every year. So I uh, first did some shoe polish and I didn't know it was going to disappear from that and wrote it on all of the graveyards. But then later I wrote it down on a piece of paper and documented all of that. And so that's somewhat of the origin of if uh, these cemeteries could talk, which we started. Um, okay, now some of what I'm hoping to talk about as I make my presentation is some of the burial customs in Bullock County, Georgia, family cemeteries, church cemeteries, community cemeteries, the establishment of the black funeral homes and their importance in genealogical research. Now, I have a relationship with all of the African Americans funeral home in Bullock County. Each time they have a funeral, they have a box where they put a program in for me. And I add that to our collection where we have over 20,000. Okay, learn about the brief histories of seven, seven of the 38 known African American cemeteries. And here's some of the stories that I've heard the elders tell me. I've heard my grandparents talk about as we go through the cemeteries. And these stories must continue. Now, a little bit of those who don't know about uh, Bullock County. Uh, you want to go back? No, you just want to do the map first. Okay. All right, that's about to stay there. Okay, Bullock County was founded in 1796. You know that Georgia was the last of the 13 original colonies. And at 1733, Oberthorpe and others came. But prior to Oberthorpe's coming, there were African Americans and others who had already visited Georgia, Ponce de Leon and many others uh, African American that traveled with the Spanish explorers. But from the English perspective, 1796. And uh, it was a very sparsely populated area, lots of pine trees. In fact, in the late 1800s, the people of North Carolina realized the importance of the pine trees to the naval industry. And we had great migration from North Carolina, and many of them were African Americans that came down to Bullock County. Also, there was an Indian group that came, uh, the Lumbee Indians, and they are from North Carolina. Many of them traveled as part of the turpentine industry, settled in Bullock County in the late 1890s, and they remained there until 1920 when they went back. Part of the challenge with the Lumpy Indians were they, it was a decision on whether they're going to integrate in the Caucasian community or the African American community. They said, no, we integrate in the Indian community. We're going back. We're not going to integrate either. And their identity was very, very important. Now, cotton, corn, peanuts, livestock, very, very important in that area. And one of the hallmarks in 1906, when the beginning of Georgia Southern University, it was started pretty much as a mechanical school, and then it came to Georgia Southern University, which you heard was integrated in 1965, the same year that I went to Statesboro High School next. So let me tell you a little bit about the Willow Hill School and the Willow Hill community. It is a community of African Americans, post slavery, gained land up until 6,000 acres, build a community, and the Willow Hill School was the center of that community. Started in 1874 as one of the first schools for African Americans in Bullock County. Now, public education in Georgia didn't start until around 1870, 1871, and in Bullock County around that same time later. And here, 1874, former enslaved individuals who could not read and write themselves, but looked down through the years and saw the importance of an education for their people, their children, and they started this great community and that community continues until today. Willow Hill School is a school that I went to. My mother went to Willow Hill. My grandmother went to Willow Hill. My great grandfather was on the board of trustees. So this Willow Hill School was so important. And so when I grew up, I wanted to keep 
the legacy and the memory of those former slaves could not read and write, but understood the value of power. In 1829 in Georgia, they made it a law to, to teach a slave or a person of color to read or write, you would be put in prison. So somebody knew the value of an education, okay. and so so did our former enslaved ancestors. So in uh, 2005, when the Woolley Hill School was put on the auction block, I was living in Ohio at that time, but I had always told folk, if that school is ever sold, let me know. So in 1920, the African American community sold the school to the Bullock County Board of Education, $20, we have the deed of sales. So when they put it on the auction block, we got on the phone and we had one week and we organized 12 descendants of the school founders and we were there at the auction, competing against a lot of folk who thought they were gonna turn that into a section eight housing, who thought they were gonna turn it into something else. But we said, there is no price for our heritage. Yes. And so we bid, didn't have all the money, but we bid it. <laughs> Cost us $124,000. So we only had about, we thought we was going to get it for about 20 though. <laughs> so we, amongst ourselves, we raked up 70000 And there's a man in Florida who knew my cousin, Larry Lee, named Willie Gary. <laughs> he gave us the other money to finish paying for it, and we paid him off within a year. Mm -hmm. So in 2005, we found the Willow Hill Heritage and Renaissance Center. Wow. Heritage to pay homage to those ancestors who came before and Renaissance, mm -hmm. new opportunity of a community. Thanks. And here is something that the old folk wrote long time ago, and I showed this because way back then, somebody recognized the importance of saving the history. Willow Hill School, 1874. It was started a long time before it came to its present site on Dan Riggs Place in a turpentine shanty in Fuller County, Georgia, with a 15-year-old Georgia Anna Riggs as the first teacher. So I always show this because it's so important. It just showed you, you don't always have to have a lot, but you have to have the thought. You have to have the vision. You have to have the passion in a turpentine shanty. All right, then. And so this was when we, in 2005, we used that same old logo for the old school to start the Harrison Renaissance Center, turn it to an historic site, a museum, a cultural center. And then when the 1619 project came about, we thought it was a good idea to do commemorating 400 years of African American history if these cemeteries could talk, because that was taking us back to the former slave ancestors and bringing their stories alive. If these cemeteries could talk, oh, oh, the story they were telling. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of cemeteries in Bullock County, Georgia. A lot of church cemeteries, there are family cemeteries. Uh, there's one public cemetery called, now called the A.C. Dunlap, but a long time ago it was called the Colored People Cemetery. And so we want to talk a little bit about burial customs uh, prior to the first African-American funeral home that came in the 20s to Bullock County, Georgia. Uh, we want to talk about uh, parlor viewing and quick bearers due to not embalming and record keeping in the family Bible, all night wakes, funeral. Now, a lot of you may not know, a lot of time in that time period, if someone died, they would be buried right away and they would have their funeral a month later. They would be a body. So that was also part of the custom as well. And uh, notices of the bear, particularly in the Primitive Baptist Church, would be in the minute. Okay. Okay. After the uh, first African-American funeral home, uh, just uh, there was no 
obituaries until the 40s in both counties. What would happen is the family would write the obituary on a piece of paper, and then someone would stand up and read it at the funeral. And I actually have a few of those in our collection okay. at uh, Willow Hill. But that's the importance. So if you could get your hand on one of those, that would be uh, indeed very valuable. Uh, the uh, There were a lot of unmarked graves, and that is one of the challenges you run into in cemeteries. They would put um, a mound of dirt. They would put sometimes colored bottles, blue, and that was a very popular color. And they would put other symbols that were important to the person, but sometimes it wasn't marked. So once family members died, if someone didn't write it down, that is lost forever. But you can, after the coming of the uh, ob at the funeral programs and obituaries, sometimes you can make connections through that information. Next. Okay, in Bullock County, the these are all of the funeral homes that were African American since the beginning of the county. The Royal Funeral Home was the first that came in the 20s. And Professor William James, a Morehouse graduate, had come down to Bullock County and started uh, the first African American high school called William James. At first, it was called States for High Industrial. And in 1948, it was changed to William James. <laughs> His son was a mortician. And so that was be the first example. And then we had the Statesboro Funeral Home. Uh, someone came out from Scriven County. That was in the 20s as well. The Riggs to 37, Motri Garden in the 40s, 50s, Barnes in the 50s, 60s. Then the last three are the newer funeral homes, and they apprenticed through James R. Barnes Funeral Home. They would come in, they would learn to trade, then they would go out and start their own. And Matthew Lovett was just started last year. And uh, 2023. And those are the funeral homes from um, Bullock County. Next. Okay. The first uh, funeral home I'm going to talk about mm. is called Fish Trap. That's what the locusts call it. But the official name is Mount Pisgah. Pisgah. Now, it was a primitive Baptist church, and there was a division in Georgia in the 1830s of the missionary from the primitive. Primitive of those that held to the old tradition. Missionary, we're gonna now create mission, let our ministers go and be taught, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a strong division. Many of my slave ancestors were members of the primitive Baptist church. And uh, Mount Pisgah has one of the largest burial sites for former enslaved individuals. And I want to talk about my great great grandfather, Andrew Donalds, born in 1812, died in 1897. He was enslaved to Robert Donaldson. Robert Donaldson was a white primitive Baptist minister from Ireland of Scottish ancestry. In the 1770s, he came to America with his father, John. They came to North Carolina, went to Burke County, and eventually settled in Bullock County. And many of these individuals were already in Bullock County when it was organized in 1796. Andrew Donaldson had two wives, and that was a very common custom back then at that time. And uh, so, and I've been able to trace both of those lines as well. Georgiana Riggs, that's her picture. She was the one who served as the first teacher. Now, these individuals are buried in the Mount Pisgah Cemetery. So I chose a few of them to sort of tell their story. Now, Andrew Donaldson was a mulatto man. So you know what mulatto means. Right. I don't have to explain that. There's a lot of mulattoes around uh, at around that time. But nobody want to talk about it. Start right. uh, once you start doing that DNA. Uh oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now this is another uh, relative of mine, Jack Littles, uh, born in 1831. I learned a lot of him from his Car the Caucasian people that owned him. He was a bricklayer, 
and he was very important to the family. In fact, uh, the wife of one of the slave owners' husband was a drunkard, loved to stay drunk. So they got Jack Littles to put corn cobs between all of his fingers and toes and sit them and light them and come into the bedroom of this drunken person and just come. And when he saw it, he thought it was a ghost. And he woke up and jumped out the window and went running away. And according to the lady who told me the story, she said he didn't drink for a long time. <laughs> yes, indeed. So this is uh, Anthony McCray. Now, he has a very interesting story. You're going to hear about his brother later on. He was born in Marion County, South Carolina, when he was a little boy. His mother was sold into slavery with his other siblings in Bullock County, and they came on the train. And I know this story because Aaron Money, who you're going to hear about a little later on, he was one of the few enslaved folk in Bullock County who wrote his autobiography. Mm -hmm. So from his autobiography, we're able to learn uh, so much. But Anthony McCray had a McCray name, and Aaron Munlin had a Monday name, but they were full-blooded brothers. Why is that? Well, there was two plantations together. One was the McCray plantation. The other was the Munlin plantation. Johnny Munlin, who was his father, used to go over and visit Hannah McCray on the other plantation. And they got together, got some little ones coming, but some of them kept one name, some of them kept the other name. So you're going to hear about him now. Hampton McCray uh, is buried in the cemetery. Now, Moses Parrish, very important. His father, Cain Parrish, born in 1810, was enslaved to Ansel Parrish, one of the largest slave owners in Bullock County. And I don't have time to talk about all of those, but Moses was important because he lived right down from the school. In 1895, he gave part of his farm to the Woolly Hill School. All right. And I want to talk a little bit about Levi Donaldson because I have a lot of other slides I'm moving a little fast. Anybody want to stop me? Feel free to do that. No. Levi Donaldson, uh, born in 1918, and in Bullock County in 1929, there was a huge tornado that came through, and it killed a lot of people. And it came through the area of the Woolly Hill community where a lot of my ancestors were. In fact, my grandmother, uh, was in that tornado. In fact, it hit the house, tore the roof off, took the kids on mattresses and took them away and landed them in fields and everything. One of my aunts couldn't be found. She was a little baby. She was born in 28. That was 29. They was looking for her. And eventually they heard her cry. Mm -hmm. And she was right on the well, getting ready to go down. They saved her from that tragedy that could have happened. And then after that, Little kids holding the mom and dad's hand, little baby in arms. They walked down the Moses Parish house. He was one of the prominent African Americans at the time, one of the largest landowners, and that's where everyone went uh, until they got uh, their homes built back. Little Levi was also in that tornado of 29 in the Woolly Hill community. I know this story because his sister told it to me, and I, ha I have all these stories recorded. So they talked about the winds of the tornado and how heavy they were. And at first they was all trying to hold the door to keep the tornado from, but you know, they did not have the power. So the tornado ripped the roof off, turned the house down. Luckily, all of them got out except little Levi. He was uh, killed in his bed. And so that created a big stir in the community. So that happened in uh, October of 29. So the same that happened around one o'clock in the morning. So all of the people came together. Albert Hendricks was the casket maker. He came over. They got the wood, and she described watching that. They would pour water on the wood that bend into a certain structure, and then they would nail it together. Then they would put White, they would put cotton, pad it with cotton. And then they would put white or gray cloth in it and put it with tacks. 
and then they put a lid on it. So that was the casket making that was done at that time. Now, he wasn't involved. You would be amazed at how many African Americans and Caucasians came together in that short period of time. They were, had a caravan of mules and wagons, horse and buggies, and a few of the African Americans who owned cars at that time in a procession going to the Rehobia Church and then down to the Mount Pisgah Cemetery and buried him that day. So in that story, you heard about casket making, you heard about a period when there wasn't a bombing, and you heard about how the community would come together in tragedy like that, student like that. Now, Georgiana Riggs is out at uh, Fish Trap also. Okay, this is the Lee Cemetery, and this is the family cemetery, and this is related to my mother's people, they were Lees. And John C. Lee was born in slavery in South Carolina. He was sold into Bullock County as a young man. He came over, he found Liddy Johnson, married her and had an extensive family. He was able to amass 700 acres of land. Many of his family members or under uh, James Young, a slave owner who was one of the largest slave owners in Bullock County. And I saw when he died in 1859, he put a list of all of his enslaved individuals and what their value was. And there I found the name of a lot of my ancestors there in 1859. Yeah. Where did you say you found that document? Those documents are found at the Bullock County Courthouse and at the library at uh, Statesboro Regional Library. Okay. You'll be amazed at what's in the library and in the courthouses. All right. Now, July Butts is another person buried there, and that's his tombstone there. Very interesting person. He came from up around uh, Sardis, Georgia. And he came under the influence of a Bishop Turner, who was uh, appointed by Abraham Lincoln as to serve in the uh, Freeman Bureau in Georgia. But he was really disillusioned about a lot of what was happening in Georgia at that time. So he started preaching about the Back to Africa movement. And so July Butt, up near uh, Sardis, Georgia area, came under his influence and sold all of his property and everything. He, his mother, and his whole family came down to Savannah, Georgia, because they were going to catch the ship to go to Liberia, Africa. Well, her, his mother uh, died uh, in Savannah, and they buried her at Laurel Cemetery. So they didn't have enough money for the ship, so that fell through, but there were previous ships that had gone to uh, Liberia, Africa. So all of those who didn't make it on that run, they stayed in Chatham County, and many of them came to Bullock County, where my ancestors and July Butts is buried in our family cemetery. Mm -hmm. he, he was a very prominent man. Now, what's interesting, he had a lot of daughters. And so Lee men always like pretty women. <laughs> so they married several of those butt girls. And so that way the butt family became into the Lee family. Cal Jack Lee is another one. He was a black cowboy. He used to herd cattle from Savannah to Statesboro, Georgia, and from Statesboro, Georgia to Savannah down the Ogeechee River. And they would camp at the Ogeechee River site. Okay. And so he, my great grandfather, Jonas Lee, used to ride a mule, and Kyle Jack Lee rode a horse. Stephen Dahl Lee, I want to put his name there because a long time ago, his house was right at the cemetery on Lee land. So if anyone died before the era of embalming, all family members would come to his house. It would be up all night with a wake, and then they would go to the cemetery the next day to bury. Eddie Wallace she lived to be 102 years old. Oh, was she a storyteller. And guess what? My recorder got all of her stories, too. <laughs> she was wonderful because she knew a lot of this history and information. 
And so she told me a lot about the schools, the churches, the people. Okay, so that's the Lee Cemetery. Now this is the Hodges Cemetery, and that's my great, great grandfather, Elder Washington Hodge, born during slavery in 1851. And uh, the cemetery is also known as the Bank Creek Cemetery because it's close to the Bank Creek Primitive Baptist Church, which was the first Primitive Baptist Church organized in Bullock County in 1879. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I do uh, that. Now, Thomas Hodges, was a member of the White Nevels Creek Primitive Baptist Church. Their names are all on the church records. He had two wives also, okay? And there's a lot of name changing when it comes to the Hodges because as some of their children were sold during slavery, they would take up other names. So there's three names. There's Hall, Brandon, and Hodges, all brothers associated with this uh, era of the name change. Now, Thomas Hodge had three sons that left when Sherman came out of Atlanta on his way to Savannah, burning everything in sight. Sherman's army camped at the Neville's Creek Primitive Baptist Church. That was the first Primitive Baptist Church in Georgia. It was founded in 1790 before Bullock County was founded in 1796. Mm -hmm. So it is an old church, but it is the church that many of my slave ancestors went to, and I find their names on the church records. But anyway, three of Thomas Hodges' son, and they had Bible names, Meshach, <laughs> Nehrach, <laughs> and Abednego. <laughs> <laughs> but they were Brandons, and they were Brandons because uh, of one of the daughters Marion or Brandon, somebody died, they married somebody else, so they take that name. It's a long story, so I won't get into that. But uh, James Hall is brother to these Brandon guys who left with the Yankees. And I went down to the Bullock County Courthouse and found records there where my great grandfather, who was the over the estate of his mom and dad, went to Cahoma, Mississippi, and found these three brothers that left with the Yankees and carried their inheritance to them. And it's documented in the Bullock County Courthouse. James Hall, he was a slave of Nathaniel Hall, even though he was a Hodge. This is his son, but he was sold there. So he has the Hodge's name. And that's the value of having these old people to tell you this stuff, because otherwise you may not ever know that. That's they know it, but you gotta ask them, why you wanna know that boy? I want to know. <laughs> James Hall was the first chairman of the Board of Trustees at Buller Hill School. It was founded in 1874. So he's a very important person, buried at the cemetery. This is his brother, Wallace. I want to tell this story briefly because Wallace married Lucindy Parrish. She was 12 years older than him. She had already been married during slavery time, but her husband was sold away from her and she never knew what happened to him. So she had a son, she then married Wallace Hodge, and they had several children together. And so I wanted to put that story in there because this is the tragedy of what happened during slavery time where families are separated. You remember after freedom came, there was many folk going all over the United States looking for their people. Have you seen so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? And so that was an important, she never found that. And I put my wife name here, Dr. Gail Jackson, uh, PhD from Ohio State University, who recently passed away. And so she and I always talked about what would happen if you go first or I go first. And I'm really, I'm glad I asked her that. And I said, baby, where would you like? She said, I want to be buried where you are going to be buried. I said, baby, you know I want to be buried with my mama, my daddy, my grandma, my granddad. I got all these generations in this Hodge Cemetery. So I laid her to rest there so in a horse-drawn carriage. Oh, right. Yes. The great beautiful grace <laughs> of a queen. Yes. And so she's resting there, waiting for me. She's a very smart lady. I met her at Ohio State University. 
And uh, somebody had to keep me up with the time now because uh, you know I keep going, going, going. But I got you. That's I met her at Ohio State University. In fact, I was in my biochemistry class, my first quarter at Ohio State University. Now, my advisor, I really believe to this day, he's trying to flunk me out. Now, why you put a first quarter graduate in a 700 course? And he's, he put me in 705 biochemistry. So when I got my first paper, I was so far in the ward, I didn't know if they were surviving for me. Oh, Lordy. And the teacher said, there are three people in this class who made perfect papers. It's so unusual, I'm going to have them stand up. So these two Caucasian males stood up, and the beautiful African-American woman stood up. <laughs> so when class was over, I was at the door waiting for them. Thank you, man. And they're southern fats. I know that. They get away from me. When you worked in the cotton field before, you know how to be persistent. I've been calling her all the way for five, talking to her, pleading with her. So when she got down to going to her apartment on Citizen Avenue, I said, after all of that, you certainly you're going to invite me for a glass of water. And she did. Yeah. And the next thing is, I remember I said, oh, I said, okay, I told him my case. Said, what do you want to eat? Let me go and buy you some groceries. I would have bought that lady some groceries first. <laughs> oh, my dear precious wife, Lord have mercy. Next. Okay, now this is the one I was talking about. Munlin, I told about Anthony McRae. They were full brothers. And he came from Meriden, South Carolina. He is the one that wrote his autobiography. He's buried in the Mullen Cemetery, which was also associated with the Banks Creek Cemetery. And uh, his mother, Hannah, she was the one that was born in South Carolina next to the Mullen Plantation. She had these children and came over to uh, Bullock County. And uh, James Riggs, who was the brother of Willie Riggs, for which Willie Hill was named, married into that family. And Willie Riggs went to Morehouse College and graduated in 1894 and came back and taught at Willie Hill. So it tells you the capacity of these former enslaved individuals who really sought education. They would give everything. And I interviewed uh, uh, Willie Riggs and uh, Jimmy Riggs' sister, she was 107 years old. I drove the way across Georgia and found her and told her story. And she gave me so much good information <laughs> about life in the Willie Hill community. These were entrepreneurs. They had their own stores. They had school, schools. They had churches. And Herschel Smith was another member. I want to talk about Hannah Stowbridge, who is related to that family. I interviewed her extensively. She invited me in her home. She was the only daughter, and the rest were boys, but she was the oldest. And back then, they were sharecroppers. And when you were a sharecropper, you have to do what the person whose farm you live on said. So she missed so much school. And so uh, she didn't get the chance to go to school until December. She's far behind. She kept missing her grades. And so she told me that hey, all the kids started being, getting bigger and bigger, and the kids were smaller and smaller, and the kids started calling her grandma. And when that happened, she said, I can't go to school anymore. And so she wanted to come out and work. And so she was really, really into the importance of education. And so she told me her story, and I wanted that story to continue because it speaks about life in communities, in the Willow Hill community, a lot of them were landowners, but there were others around that community who were sharecroppers. So Hannah, thank you for telling me your story and we have her all recorded in our archives next. This is the Color People Cemetery and this was the largest African-American cemetery in Bullock County. It was a public cemetery and the re it's now known as the AC Dunlap. And the reason I mentioned that those of you who are blues enthusiasts mm -hmm. may have heard of Blind Willie Blind. McTell, who sang the Space Bird Blues. And so his mother is buried at that cemetery. And we uh, went out in that cemetery, and they had one date when they thought it was found, but we found some tombstones there that gave it an earlier date, mm -hmm. 1903. Mm -hmm. So that's the advantage sometime of doing that. I want to 
talk about Miss Gussie Lanier Donaldson buried out there. She was one of the early black nurses at the Bullock County Hospital. And at that time, uh, African American had to go in the back. I remember when I stayed with my grandfather in the hospital, he was on a large ward, all open, just several beds. The Caucasian people, they had another section of the hospital they were in. And so she really attended a lot to the African American people, and she was a special person. And Edna McCray, how many times? 10 minutes. Edna McCray Baldwin uh, met President Obama. I went to Washington, D.C., and interviewed her several times, gave me extensive history. Please understand the value of uh, interviewing these old folk. And the Buffalo family, very prominent family in uh, Bullock County and Statesboro. And uh, they own stores, projects, et cetera. Okay. This is the Brown Chapel Cemetery. And this is a very interesting story. I interviewed my great uncle and Miss Hetty, and I heard them always talking about Brown Chapel Cemetery, Brown Chapel. But many of the local African Americans no longer knew of Brown Chapel. So I kept looking because I said, it's got to be in this county. So I went to these old white people and asked if they had ever heard of Brown Chapel. Yes, I know that A.K. Lottie used to work with us. She's buried there. And I'm a husband, Bob Ray. I said, can you help me find it? So they took, sent me to a Lisa Deloach house. And Lisa DeLoach was a very nice white lady. She was very generous. She made some nice lemonade for me and was talkative. And then she took me down to the cemetery about a mile way down in the woods. When I got to this cemetery, she knew about it because her husband and son, they hunt around that cemetery. So I saw this canopy of old trees, cedar trees, grass grown up. And then if you look down, you could see a few tombstones coming up mm -hmm. through that. I said, oh, my God, this is the Brown Chapel Cemetery that I had heard about. So my daughter and I, we've done a, pro a podcast. Mm -hmm. So if you Google oh. Brown Chapel Cemetery, you will get a lot of the details on how we found that. Because Brown Chapel's uh, church uh, moved to a different site. And then the church burned down and then all the members disappeared in the other. So the cemetery was lost for a long period of time. So we resurrect that. And that's one of the projects we are now working on in terms of restoration of that cemetery. Alice Hall born there. And that was one of the tombstones. And I won't have time to talk about her. OK. Yeah. Yes. It was a method. Okay. Methodist Episcopal. And if you and go back to that slide, who was the name on the hands? Go, go back. How do I go back? Can you go backwards? Lucinda Thompson. Born in 1844. I found a lot of these just laying on the ground, just right near the gravesite. And then I found a lot of indentations. And so it was a large area. In fact, I wrote all the names down. I just gave you one example. The clarity of that and the quality of the stones after all of this, you had the hanging moss. It was a really eerie and aesthetic and peaceful sight just looking at that. And the trees had preserved that over all those years. And the cemetery was founded in just after uh, enslavement because the oldest uh, market there was from the 1870s. So the church was built and it's gone. Oh, the church building had long time moved away from that. It had moved to another site. And then in 1952, that burned. And so all of the people integrated into other churches in Boa County. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is Old Bethel. And I uh, want to talk about. Um, Cornelius Moore, born during slavery in Virginia, and he was brought down to Bullock County, Georgia. He, after slavery, had a, a blacksmith shop and had an extensive family in Bullock County, Georgia. 
Isaac Riggs, that's his picture. Uh, we have the records when he was a small child, he and his siblings and his mother were sold on the steps of the Bullock County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have time to tell this story, but I want you to look up uh, the matriarch. Struggle, yeah. uh, struggle in progress. It's struggle in, in progress. Um, Harriet Riggs, the matriarch, you will be amazed because this is a connection between the white and black ancestry mm -hmm. as it relates to Isaac Riggs. And you can see where they were sold how much they were sold for on the Bullock County Courthouse step. Uh, Isaac Riggs' mother was owned by her sister. Okay, and so it's a very, very interesting story. Dora Donaldson, uh, uh, my great-great-grandfather's sister, uh, Mulatto, uh, a lot of her children became very prominent in the community. Uh, she was the daughter of that Andrew Donaldson from Fish Trap Church. Ned Love, her son, H.W.B. Smith, a very important person. He went to Georgia State University and graduated in 1901 and came back and taught at the Willow Hill School. Okay. So you see the importance of these connectivity. And now his grandson, Dr. Hank Smith, a cardiologist, is on our board. So all that connection. All right. Now I'm going to see, go to the next one. Okay, so we want to want you to see uh, a small video of one of our cemetery tours, and that's why I kind of moved a little faster because you that's know I can talk a little bit. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, we have to see the ad. Say okay. what? Okay. <laughs> it make sure you have the volume then. Okay. So when it does come on, you can hear. All right. Can you hear it? No, you can't hear. Can you turn it louder? Can you do it better? That's one of our tools. That's Andrew Donaldson. All their names. That's our school before. That's our school now. Well, you know, museum. Okay, so that was just a little sample of what we do once a month. Our next tour is going to be at the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church, founded in 1874 in Bullock County. And so we focus on the formerly enslaved. We focus on ministers, teachers, and family names and uh, bring their stories back to life. So I'll pause here. What you got next? Okay, this is some of the families. Beautiful. Uh, this is these are slave people. That's Moses Parish where the school was. His yeah. wife. Okay, this is my great grandparents. 
these are some of Dora Donaldson's folk. Now, this these were considered prominent families at that time because they could afford to take pictures, and many of them became school teachers in the system. And that H. W. B. Smith that I was talking about, uh, that uh, was his wife right there, Amanda, who was also a school teacher. So uh, I think that's it. And oh, this is another family that came down from North Carolina, father slavery born. And then these, uh, I put some of the names there because they uh, became teachers in the Bullock County school system. They went to that Stace for High Industrial School started by Professor William James. And uh, they went out into those one room schoolhouses. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it so much. If you have some questions. One moment. Um, I want to make sure that we have contact information for you and that you tell us that date of that tour. Yes. Uh, this, it's going to be uh, the, that's the 16th of February. Oh. That's cool. it's every third Saturday we do African American Cemetery Tour. And the, is the third Saturday be the 17th? Be the 17th. And so everybody's welcome to come and you will learn so much. Uh, we identify about how many formerly enslaved are buried. Now, New Hope has a very interesting history where the intersection between African-American and Caucasian history, because one of the slave owners, they have children. And so these stories are now we're freely talking about. How do you advertise and how do you fund this? Well, well, first of all, we pretty much fund ourselves uh, originally. And then last year, we wrote a grant. How much we get? $95,000? $92,000. Speak to it. To Woo! help us get individuals because it's so much work and we can no longer do it all ourselves. So now we have interns from Georgia Southern University working with us to help us. Um, we got one, that from one moment. I got it. I see it. Uh, that was from IMLS, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Jackson, I just want to make sure that we extend um, grace of time. You guys good out here? You want to ask the questions and you have the time? Oh, okay, wonderful. So then we're going to start right here to the left over um, up against the wall. My sister, my man. Yes, you. Yes, ma'am. You. It, it does work, and yes, we have plans, and for all those graves that we find, we don't know the names we put across. We, we, we will be putting across. And then right in the yellow sweatshirt? The uh, Willowfield Heritage Center. Yes. Uh, going to that website, what would we see? We would see your presentation or a lot of that information. Oh, okay. You go to our website, W. W, W, there it is. Uh, you will be able to see a lot of our presentations. You will see the last cemetery we, tour we did last month. And then a lot of us, they're on YouTube. Uh, in April the 27th, if any of y'all are available, please come. We have a taste of struggle. We do that every year where we cook underground like during the era of slavery mm. and then we serve that on the ground and it's very popular and people like it would you call a taste of struggle a taste of struggle april the 27th and it's going to be at the willie hill harrison renaissance center there and we dress in period dress for that yes, right so here very nice. yes ma'am right do you all have any um as as i was listening to you speak i had a bittersweet moment I love everything you presented. It was wonderful. Yet, yeah, what happens when you're the only one in the family interested in doing all of what you're doing plus keeping up family history? Because I had a cousin, uh, Charles Watts, who passed away. Yeah. He had just found a grant to help um, clean up cemeteries, yes. but he passed as far as they would get the information. And I'm looking to clean up the ones in Butts County. Yeah. We have the one that's clean in Dodge County, but different counties that my family got up. How do we and get that's why I write things down. I have an extensive 
documented history uh, or recording or recording myself. Plus, my all of my children on the board, mm. all of them, Dr. King A. Jackson, Dr. Tiva Jackson, Jelani Jackson. Well, we, we have 12 member boards and all of us are directly linked. And so what we're trying to do is give it down to our family. But we're also inviting other people in the community who have any kind of connection to be a part of us. So we have a volunteer group that come in to help us out. But documenting is going to be your best bet because I have some written documents for elders. Yeah, right. I record some of them. That's the blessing. Of that is a blessing to do that. In fact, my wife is the one that pushed me to say, Ben, why don't you record your stuff? I said, Oh, nobody want to hear me. She's like, mm -hmm. Do it. So I listened to it until we start there. So team building with your community and family and documentation. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so yes. 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 Thank you so much for this presentation. I am an Ox member. I was trying to show my church so you all could identify who I am. For those of you who are not members of Ox, we yeah. have some wonderful research groups that's going on. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I saw in, and we do have representation for all of the southern states, North Carolina, yeah. Virginia, and all, but I just want to make a few connections here to your presentation. It was wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I just thought I could just be there when you were doing that. So Brown Chapel, and I did ask the question about the religion. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we talked about, you know, when the young man was doing the Auburn Avenue presentation, we talked about preservation, mm -hmm. preserving the churches and cemetery. Brown's Chapel and Bethel are both names in the African Methodist Acceptable Church. Mm -hmm. The African Methodist Episcopal Publishing House in Nashville would have background information mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. And then many of the Southern um, enslaved owners um, went, sent their children to Wilberforce University yes. in Ohio, mm -hmm. in Ohio State, mm -hmm. because they wanted their mulatto children yes. to go up and off okay. to be educated. And then there's the HBCUs here in Atlanta that has a lot of information. And Mercer University, we kept yes. Methodist records. So yeah. if you're looking for those kinds of records, those are there. But just to make it all short, come to us, be a member, and find out what we're doing because we kind of help you pull all of these yes. things together. And you've done an excellent research. And lastly, <laughs> those names, Donaldson, McCray, yes. Parker, um, another one that you had there. Oh, oh, I just, those names, if you remember the Louisiana Purchase and you remember your history of Louis and Clark when they explored the West, yes. they moved from the North Carolina credit to Bathroom yes. at the Plea de They moved to Georgia. Yes. And in 1803, Thomas Jefferson yes. allotted these, whoever wanted to go to the land of milk and honey to yes. the Mississippi. Yes would go to Washington, Mississippi and establish a settlement there. So McCrary was there more, that's the other name, McCrary, more yeah. Donaldson, of course, Fitzgerald. And these were the people who had the ships that were taking those people to New Orleans first, to yeah. the municipal auditorium, which is now Louis Armstrong Park, mm -hmm. to Natchez, which is my hometown, yes. at the Forks of the Road, and they were sold there on the auction block. And Emma has on the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, and the, the Buffalo Soldiers from Florida yeah. are going to come to Natchez in June, June the 6th through the 12th. And they are going to start at the Vicksburg's uh, military base. They mm -hmm. want to go to Jackson, to Lula, Natchez, and yeah. Fort Gibson, where the Civil War was fought. So you can get a lot of fun. They yes. have connections. Yeah. Ms. Judy, are you uh, part of Ask a Genealogist um, panel today? Yes, I am. Okay, there you go. No, no, Just going to let you know. That's a, that's a little that's bit. That's a really important yes. connection that a lot of us not think about. The thing about. Is, is that you have to know the history, and you plug your family into the history. That's it. We, we started with plugging our family in and trying to find the history. Do it the okay. opposite way, because the other the records were written by the people who were educated. So you'll want to go to their records and then find out if your people were a part of that thing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I, I know we were once a member and I'm going to make sure we, we update our membership because we have two articles in your magazine. 
And we do road trips, so we can do a road trip as well. Yeah. We love to do road trips because we want to go see. Dr. Jackson, yeah. do you have any final comments? We'd love you to leave us with. So Dr. Jackson is going to share with okay. us any final comments. I'm so happy that you all came out. And if I could leave you a pearl, all of us are a part of history. All of us are part of American history. That's right. And there's something called archival silence mm -hmm. where we are absent from the books. Mm -hmm. We're absent from many of the records and we are counting on you to put our people in those records. After all, who is best to tell your story? Thank y'all so much. Yes, <laughs> Lord, I'm going to tell you. OK, there we have it. So inside of that, also for those of us who are asking about how to get um, uh, the funeral homes engaged in, you know, researching the cemeteries, taking yes. inventory, so on and so forth. So we continue on that theme, and I'm certain there will even be more that will be able to answer your questions for Ask Your Genealogist. But please make sure you talk to Dr. Jackson because you heard all of those records and archives and documents and railways. So he's got definitely going to have methodologies. Mm -hmm.